get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm excited. We have Michael Drew, founder of Promote a Book. He's one of the most successful book promoters on the planet with 84 consecutive books on the national bestseller list like the New York Times, Wall Street Journal. He's also helped over 1,000 Amazon titles to number one. He's worked with authors such as Peter Diamandis, Marshall Goldsmith, which also just latest made the bestseller list, T. Harv Eker, and many more. Michael, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. It's good to be here. I'm excited. You have some great stories. So I always like to include a fun fact. And we were trying to find out, you know, you're a sushi connoisseur, your wife says you, you like bowling, which she thinks is weird, which I don't think is that weird. But <laughs> one thing is, there's no doubt you said that you're batshit crazy because you just make things happen when you maybe don't know how to make those things happen. And um, what was one of those things you were talking about, one with, with Roy Williams? Well, you know, um, Roy would say that talent is simply the combination of experience with right brain pattern recognition. Mm-hmm. And part of that right brain pattern recognition for me is my ability to see how to get a hold of people, whoever, whoever they are. And, um, you know, Roy, Roy is the owner of the fourth largest ad agency in North America for, for buying radio advertising. He's a legend in radio. Um, he, the, um, he's known as the wizard of ads. And anyone who knows anything about marketing, copyright, or, or advertising knows yeah. who, who Roy is. Um, and so the, the, there's a movement, as we all know, from uh, terrestrial radio to online digital and app-based radio. Yeah. Um, and Roy still, would still uh, point out that radio online or off, is, it's, it's the same process. But the buyers that he's going after at the local radio stations versus online are different. And the way that ads are bought online or off are also different, right? right. And so he was um, attempting to get a hold of the the one of the executives at Pandora Radio hmm. um, because the sales reps of Pandora Radio they di- they don't understand how radio actually works in terms of its advertising value they were looking at it in terms of uh, cost per million PP like uh, cost per click the, stuff. the yeah. internet based stuff yeah. but radio is about repetition repetition and saliency and all of those things so the way Ra- Roy buys radio on traditional radio is different than how you would buy ads online because it, because of the way that the brain works is very different mm-hmm. and also online I can click on something whereas in a in, in an ad on Pandora I can't click on anything I'm just I'm, I'm just listening to it just like remember radio it, yeah. right so it, it, the the value to the business is the same in Pandora as it is um, in traditional professional radio and he could not get past the goobers it, at, at, in the sales department. And so he was about to send out a scathing uh, article <laughs> in, um, in Radio Inc., which is the top radio in, uh, trade publication about it. And he mm. sent it off to me to read just to get my feedback. And I said, you know what, Roy? Hold on. Give me, give me an hour. Let me see what I can do to see if I can help you out. So I called and I got a hold of, I got a hold of the CMO of, um, of uh, Pandora and I set up a call for Pandora and uh, the CMO of uh, Pandora and Roy to get together. And in fact, uh, they've since started working together and, and applying Roy's uh, philosophy on radio buying and all of those things. So um, I didn't know Pandora. I, have, I don't work in that capacity per se. I'm not in radio or even in, in digital radio. But right. you anyway. just make things happen. You know, what, that's yeah. what's also really interesting about your story, Michael, which we'll get into because we talk about some of the, the past positions and they're like, just go figure out how we can get on the New York Best Times, you know, selling, you know, best selling list. So with the CMO, Pandora, what's some of the what's the approach that you took to help, you know, get them in touch? Because you seem to do that a lot in different different avenues. Well, there's a, there's a couple of, of strategies or tactics, but the, the the most important is that selling, and this is true in marketing as well. Selling is the transference of confidence from one person to another. Mm-hmm. So the very first thing you have to do is be confident, and the more confident you are, the easier 
your objective is to accomplish. So if I call, if I find out who the CMO is at Pandora by doing some basic research and I find out his phone number and I call and I get his assistant, well, the assistant's objective is to keep people away from the the C-suite person, CEO, whatever, except that if the person who's calling them is more important than they are and the assistant feels that, they'll give you access mm-hmm. because they the last thing that they want to do is look bad to them. Even if they don't know who I am right. or who you are, the last thing they want to do is look b- bad yeah. to their boss that this big person called them and they didn't set that up. Mm-hmm. And so when, when the number one book marketer in the world <laughs> calls to talk to the CMO representing his client who owns the fourth largest ad agency in North America who's about to who is the number one expert in radio who's about to write a scathing article about um, about Pandora in the number one trade publication Radio Inc. It's not difficult to be able to get someone's attention. But what you have to do <laughs> right. is know going in, you have to have the confidence, you have to do the research right. to know who you're talking to, know know the language, know what the problem is, the the disconnect between the two organizations and go in and I'm calling, hey, you know, I'm trying to solve a problem here. This is this is what's going to happen. I am the number, I am the number one book, literally the number one book marketer in the world. Get me, can you get me on the phone with your boss, please? This is what's going on. And she's like, yep, let's set up a call for thirty minutes. Had a ten minute conversation, and we're done. So, but that's that's how you do all sales. You have to figure out who the audience is. You have to figure out what their felt need is. Yeah. You need to figure out their communication style. And then you have to go in with supreme confidence that you that you're going to be able to serve the um, the values of all parties in in that. And the other thing is you have to go in not from a sales standpoint, but from a I'm go, I'm I'm trying to deliver value because if they feel like you're selling, whether you are or not, if they feel like you're selling, then they're not going to want to engage. Yeah, love that. Yeah, thanks for sharing that because we'll talk about how you figured out and what position you're in to have to figure out the New York Times bestseller list. But um, I like to go back to the beginning and where it all started from. Where are you from and what was it like growing up? You know, I grew up in uh, Provo, Utah, large uh, Mormon family. We had eight kids. Oh, wow. Um, Yeah, it was a big family. And um, when I was nine, my my mother was a a stay-at-home mom for until I was about – 12. Um, and my father was a low paid professor of literature at Brigham Young University. Hmm. And so he, we had eight kids and he couldn't afford to pay for our school clothes for that year. So in, in Utah, we have, um, we don't have the Salvation Army. We have the Mormon Church's version, which is uh, the Desert Industries. And so they you can go in and get clothes and other things. And so um, the family had to go in to get their school clothes that year into Desert Industries. And I, I wasn't happy with that. Hmm. And so I said, how can I want new clothes? How can I earn the money hmm. to be able to buy me new school clothes this year? And so what I devised was that college students are lazy. <laughs> Nine college kids are lazy. Right. And they have schoolwork to do. They they want to they want to date. They want to do other things. So what I did is I went to BYU Student Housing and started knocking on doors. Mm. You're nine. You're nine. I'm nine. Yeah. I'm nine. Okay. Um, and I started doing odd jobs, taking out the trash, cleaning dishes, cleaning windows, vacuuming, and I ended up making on average hundred hundred and fifty dollars an hour. Wow! Holy cow! Because well, you pay me five dollars to take out the trash. I can do a lot of those in an hour. You want me to clean your 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 your, your small seven hundred square you know the front part of your seven hundred square foot um, apartment? I can do that in fifteen minutes if I work really hard and really fast. And I can get paid five dollars for the floors and ten dollars for the dishes. You know, a house in fifteen twenty minutes would be fifty dollars fifty dollars an hour. Mm-hmm. And most college kids. They're pretty lazy. Their houses aren't particularly good, uh, particularly clean. They're gross. Um, let's be honest. They, yeah. they, well, they yeah. can be. It's a little different for BYU because um, at BYU, drinking and smoking is not allowed, and mm. they don't allow cohabitation. So it's just men or women in, in apartments. So it's mm. a little um, based on based on the apartments. It's a little cleaner than my experience outside of Utah yeah. with college kids. 
but um, it, still, they're they're lazy, and so the, the cleaning needed to be done. So I'd go in and make 100, 150 an hour, depending upon what was going on. And so I was able to, within a day, earn more than enough money for me to get school clothes and and uh, backpacks and school supplies and everything for me for for that upcoming year. And what I realized then is that there was a lot of money to be made with lazy college kids, and so. Um, I worked every summer to put together a team of other kids to work for me. And by the time I was 12, I had between six to 10 different kids working for me, uh, brought in a lot of money. Uh, I couldn't tell you how much, and I'm sure the IRS would like to know and be paid, (laughs) but it was a lot of money. Um, So where does that come from, that that early entrepreneurial seed? Because your your dad's a professor, your mom's a stay-at-home mom. Where did you you even get that inclination to do that? It was just an issue of I wanted something, and the only way I could get it was to take care of myself and go and do it. I, I don't know if, if it's spread into my DNA, if it was um, if it was necessity. Uh, I don't know if you saw one of your siblings doing something or someone in your family. I, my twin yeah. and I are the oldest. Um, certainly within the Mormon culture, Mormon missionary work is a major part of, of that culture, mm-hmm. so we, cer- we, we certainly saw that. Um, Interestingly enough, Salt Lake uh, in the world right now is the number one city for entrepreneurship, and Provo is number three. Where I grew up is number three for entrepreneurship. Hmm. So that is kind of part and parcel of that culture. Right. And so I suppose I saw a lot of that being um, being reflected to me as I grew up. But that I didn't. I, my twin and I are the oldest, and I don't have any any particular family member that I can remember directly yeah. having influence on me. You know what's also interesting, Michael, is this theme of confidence. Like you talked about with Roy's story, like not many nine-year-old kids are going to go knocking on college doors. Um, what what gave you that confidence just to think, oh, I'm just going to go knocking on strangers' doors and, and uh, you know, sell, sell essentially? Well, in, in that context, probably my um, grandfather, my, my mother's father um, and my mother's side of the family um, – my great grandmother uh, was Beatrice Marchant was the first elected woman legislature in the state of Utah. Hmm. She was the the one that personally championed the EPA into the state of Utah, even though it got defeated there as as its first state to be defeated. Um, she was a, a Mormon Democrat, and um, Democrats in the state of Utah are particularly rare. So I come from a very I come from the largest line of Democrats as a family in Utah, the, the oldest and the biggest. Hmm. Uh, from that capacity. And so when you grow up um, with a culture that says you can't be a good Mormon and be a Democrat, um, that goes is against confronting you. Yeah. It, 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 your, your, your only objective is either to capitulate or to say, well, I'm, I don't agree and I'm going to fight that. So mm. my grandfather, um, Maurice Marchant, uh, and my grandmother, Valoy, both ran in the most conservative for, for office in the most conservative district in the U.S. as Democrats hmm. over and over and over again. So I got to watch their tenacity and willingness to to go out and run because it was the right thing to do, not because yeah. they expected to win, but because they they wanted the alternative voice to be heard. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, you said you didn't have fun facts. Like these are all fun facts. You're a twin. You're one of eight kids. Um, so fast forward to high school for a little bit. You have some interesting turns in high school. Tell me about tell me about that towards the end of high school. Well, you know what's interesting is um, my father and I never really got along. And um, when he left. I, I spent, as most of us do in our childhood, looking to fill voids. In that case, I was looking to fill the void for um, uh, the lack of the perceived love for my father. Mm. And uh, so I was in high school, um, had lots of, didn't necessarily follow the Mormon uh, rules or systems um, uh, in application in my own life. And um, kind of 4.0, the whole thing, and got heavily involved in, in girls and um, when I was a senior in high school, um, met a girl and, uh, we decided I was 18 then we decided to leave. She was from Washington state. So we left, um, home the, uh, beginning of the second semester of my senior year, uh, and moved to, uh, to Washington state from, uh, wow. Bellingham, from Bellingham in the South to probably from Bellingham in the North to, um, was it Ferndale, um, Olympia in the South. 
and uh, we were in that area. And for about six months in Bellingham, I, I went between being homeless or living in a motel Jeez. and selling drugs. I was pretty good at that. Um, selling is not a hard Holy thing cow. to do. And, um, what kind of drugs? Anything not, that would, if this anything, will get you arrested, don't don't say any, any, anything that was legally available. Then, not legally, but anything that that was available mm. in North America. Then, um, there are thing there there are new drugs on the market now that weren't that that didn't exist then. Right. Um, and so after that, I I moved back to um, uh, broke up with a girl, moved back to my mom's house, and um, was uh, was working at a Burger King. Managing a Burger King at, at at eighteen and a half, and um, met a girl, got married. Um, my, the woman that I married, who's a BYU student, uh, she said that it was too smart to manage a Burger King. She asked me to go get a different job, and so she helped me find a job at a company in South Provo called Executive Excellence, which at mm. the time was a division of the Covey Leadership Center before it merged with Franklin yeah. and became Franklin Covey. Right. And so I worked there, and in the first three months, I became the number three salesperson selling the magazine Executive Excellence, right. and that's only significant because the then number one, two, uh, number one, two, and four and five salespeople had been there for five plus years and were renewing their subscriptions, and so I'd come in and I was generating all this new revenue, and right. then the merger between Franklin and Covey occurred, and the executive editor for the magazine, Ken Shelton, was given the magazine by Stephen R. Covey. Um, and um, in exchange, as Ken put it, for ghostwriting Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Now, I don't know that's for true. Um, other people like Greg Link have told me that, that Ken didn't write it. I, I don't know. I simply know what, what Ken told me at the time. Right. But he was for whatever reason, he was given the, the magazine from Stephen R. Covey. Yeah. And he came to me and he said, hey, Michael, we publish all of these great business authors in our magazines. Why don't we start publishing their books? And as a young, naive 19 and a half year old, I'm like, yeah, let's, let's go, or 18 and a half year old, I'm like, let's go ahead and do that. And so we did. And I failed miserably, but I worked really, really hard at learning and understanding the publishing industry. Um, Ken is a great writer and editor. He's a poor marketer. Hmm. He didn't understand publishing, and he looked at publishing from more of an academic sense than from a commercial sense. Hmm. And I learned the commercial industry, and I, I impressed a fairly important person in the publishing industry. Her name was uh, Miriam Bass, Bass. She worked for our distributor. Now, publishing, publishers don't sell directly to the retailers most of the time. Um, there are about 35,000 publishers today. There are a dozen major uh, retailers that can carry a book. They're not those dozen retailers might have another dozen buyers. One, you know, one for science fiction, one for fantasy, one for business, one different for stuff, categories. different categories, or yeah. there might be a dozen or two dozen buyers, but there's certainly not 35,000 people for the, the, the publishers to meet with. Yeah. So the New York publishers will make their presentations directly to, um, the public, to the retailers, but all of the other small publishers go through something called a distributor and a distributor will represent 50, 100, 200, a thousand publishers right now. I believe the biggest one is national book network with 2,500 publishers hmm. and, and the distributor, Distributor um, acts as a, a as a filter for the the retailers, and so all of the publishers pitch their books to the distributor, and then the distributor takes the best books to the bookstores. Mm. And so, Miriam, ba uh, so what you have if you have hundreds or thousands of, of publishers before the publisher presents to the dis distributor's sales reps, there is an in between because there's still too many. There's still too, too many. Yeah. Still too much. So you have publisher reps that represent 10, 10 publishers that figure out their top 10 or 15 books and take them to the, the sales reps and mm. present them. And so our sales rep was a woman by the name of Miriam Bass. Now Miriam is a legend because, because she was the first woman book buyer for a retailer, for a, for a, a now defunct um, uh, bookstore out of, um, uh, out of uh, California called Chapters. Um, and anyway, or Crown Books, pardon me, Crown Books. And so she was the first woman buyer. And she, when that went to function, went to be to, to work for National Book Network as a distributor, and she was our our rep. Mm -hmm. So I worked really hard, and I impressed her. And one of her other publishers that had just come off of a huge success, Bard Press, with their book Nuts, Southwest Airlines Crazy Recipe for Success, yeah. was in look 
uh, they were they, they were looking to expand the company. They were looking for someone to come in and do marketing and PR. And I'm 19 and a half, and Miriam said, "Hey, there's this young buck out of Provo, Utah. Mm-hmm. Why don't you consider hiring him?" And what so, did right, you do to impress her, Michael? What do you remember? Just working really hard. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I was willing to go out and to do the research and to to understand the mm-hmm. industry. The, the thing is, is that publishing is systematic. There are lots and lots and lots of rules. So you have my my boss, Ken Shelton who is looking at it from a, a content standpoint, an editorial standpoint. That wasn't my job at all. My job was to figure out how to sell books and how right. to maximize distribution. So I had to go learn the mechanics of it. And I was able to do that and then translate it back to both Ken and to our authors at Executive Excellence to start mm-hmm. getting some sales results. Yeah. So we went from nothing to being able to see some sales because of the research and work that I was willing to do. Again, I go go back to my, my initial story with Roy Williams. The first thing you've got to do is is do the research to understand what you're doing and who you're communicating with. Mm -hmm. And as a publisher, our number one customer was Miriam Bass. Mm. Our number two customer um, was the uh, sales reps. The number three customer was the the bookstores. And the number four customer was the author. More important than the author, more important than the buyer of the books, was Miriam Bass, the sales reps, and the buyer at the retailers. If I don't delight and excite all three of those levels yeah. there is no books on the shelf to be able to sell to a consumer so it, the consumer doesn't make any difference until i make those first three sales if that makes yeah, sense yeah so when you said you failed early on what things did you try that didn't work or that when you say you failed what does that mean well if you don't know what you're doing i'm going to buy an ad here well an ad is going to do what because right. I ask this because probably most people, a lot of people are probably doing the things that you were doing early on, you know, that was not working. Well, I remember back then, we're talking about 99, 2000, mm-hmm. the, um, actually back 98, 99, um, the internet didn't exist in the way that it does today. Amazon right. wasn't a major player in the space yet. Um, there was no such thing as social media. You, uh, you were dealing with. Um, doing fax blasts to the media to be able to get media attention. You were dealing with traditional author tours. You were dealing with book signings. And this was in the transitionary period of time where those things didn't work anymore. Right. Right. So I was doing all the things that I researched that I thought would work, and they just didn't work. And so what I had to start becoming a student of was how to build a platform. Hmm. Right, a platform that translated into um, the book sales that I could then translate in language to Miriam and the sales reps and to the retailers. Mm-hmm. And so it, you just what I did is I researched what, what is everybody else doing. Let me see what they're doing. We're going to buy ads and we're going to we're going to put the author on the author tour. We're going to do a TV satellite tour. We're going to do all of these things. And most of the things didn't work most of the time. Mm-hmm. And so you, I just learned I became a student of what was effective communication what wasn't mm-hmm. right um so what was working with when you started to get some initial results what was working to help people build their platform um you know what what it, what i found that i had to do the, the truth is if you have a business now that, that's a offline business there are things that you're doing that work in an offline business now I said earlier that marketing and selling is the transference of confidence from one person to another. Um, selling is done in an intimate environment. You and I right now are having an intimate engagement. When we move over, when your listeners, your viewers watch this, they're going to be viewing it in a non-intimate environment. You and I can engage, and this type of engagement will emulate to the very best of our ability what intimate could be in a non-intimate environment, but it's still being presented in a non-intimate environment. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so what, what I've always found to be true, um, especially back then, was to evaluate what the business was doing in an intimate environment and to figure out how to translate those into non-intimate environments. All advertising in any medium is simply the the translation of intimate communication into non-intimate communication. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. So it, it, it was simply an issue of figuring out. And it's it, for me, it's always been done on a case-by-case basis. If you have an offline successful business, you figured something out. You have some either conscious or unconscious competency of things that you do well. So then it's simply that, that translation of that in, in, into um, marketing and advertising mediums. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so what did you learn from Miriam? 
Um, well, one of the, the things I learned very early in my career from Miriam and from Ray, Ray Bard when I moved over there and then to my first best-selling author, Roy Williams, was about relationship. Mm. I was able to note that she was an expert in her space and that she had an infinite amount more knowledge than I did and she had an infinite more reach than I did working with the, the both the sales reps and with other publishers to know what was going on. And so I, I put my own pride away and I said, you know what? I'm going to work really hard. I'm going to outwork everyone else. It's the only asset that I have. And I'm going to be open to deconstructing and learning things, but I've got mm -hmm. to put mentors in my life. I've got to put people around me that know what they're doing. Yeah. So Miriam taught me uh, a lot about distribution and about the, how her sales reps thought and how the buyers at, at, at the, at the um, bookstores felt. And then I was able to take that and figure out, okay, how do I translate that back to the author and how do I get the author to give me what I need to give to Miriam and, and, and back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, and so I learned a lot about publishing at the, at the beginning of my career from, from her and then, I, and then I took that and, and figured out how to, to parlay that into marketing from the authors. Mm -hmm. um, and then she got me the job at, at Bard Press and, mm. and Ray Bard is a legend in business book publishing. Mm -hmm. He has published some of the business, bi biggest business books ever. And um, all of the New York publishers look to Ray to um, see what he's doing as uh, future pacing for what they're going to be doing on their books moving forward. Mm -hmm. Every one of Ray book, Ray's books are revolutionary. In fact, last year he had the, the last two years he's had the number one business book, which was The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papasan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Jay Papasan. Yeah. And so, um, brilliant guy uh, who underst not only understood publishing better than anyone else, but he also understood um, platform and he taught me the real meaning of platform and he understood how to line up the needs of the author, the needs of the consumer, and mm -hmm. the needs of the retailers all at the same time. I had different elements of that coming in, but I was able to work with Ray for three and a half years at his at his feet, learning how all of these things mm -hmm. work and fit together. Now, Ray and I work together on all of the books that, that he publishes now, but um, I have to say that everything that I know in publishing started with mm -hmm. Miriam, but really got fleshed out. I probably got 20% from Miriam, and the next 70% mm -hmm. from Ray, and the last 10% is what I've been able to learn and develop on my own. Yeah. So what was it like working with Ray? Intense and amazing. Ray is, is um, one of the most brilliant men you'll ever meet, and he's incredibly brilliant when it comes to um, what we call chunking content into bite-sized components that consumers will digest and be able to, to, to understand. So, What's some of the best advice he's given you? You know what? Um, he, the best advice is for me to just go out and do. He he he's he's given me when I worked for him. He gave me free reign. He said, "This is the objective. Now go figure out how to make that thing happen. I'm, I'll give you whatever support that you need. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to pay you to go with giving you the support to go figure out these things. Just make sure that they happen." So he saw who I was, my mm -hmm. potential, and my tenacity and perseverance to make things happen, and he invested in that. And he simply said. I want you to go figure this thing out. Mm -hmm. So the first thing that he said was, Mike, what our authors want more than anything else in the world is to be a New York Times bestselling author. What I want you to do is go figure out the New York Times bestseller. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's all he said. He said, go right. figure it out. And he empowered me to go and do that. And that's exactly what I did. I started literally, I called the people at the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, New York Times bestsellers on the phone. And I asked them, like I, I flat out, how does your bestseller list work? And they all laughed and said, well, we're not going to tell you that. But because I was willing to ask the question, they all laughed. They all thought it was funny. I was 19 and a half. They knew I was young. But they were willing to develop. Uh, they were willing to continue to have. They weren't offended by it because right. I was willing to ask the question. They were willing to develop a relationship with me. Right. And over the years, that's what I did. I developed the relationships with the different yeah. Um, bestsellers is uh, to the point that the gentleman who used to compile the Wall Street Journal bestsellers list, Robert J. Hughes, Bob Hughes, he now works for me. Um, he's a he's a partner of ours, running the department that is ghostwriting. For yeah, Audible. So yeah, I see all the posts on uh, on the blog. Yeah, now I know exactly Bob Hughes. Yeah, Bob Hughes, right? So Bob literally was the person who compiled the Wall Street Journal bestsellers list for the Wall Street Journal until oh. they turned it over to BookScan a few years ago. So. Oh. Um, but you don't have that kind of relationship with someone unless you're willing to invest the time, energy, mm -hmm. and effort into doing that. So, yeah. 
I like how you went. You go straight to the source. You're like, forget everything else. I'm just going to call them, ask how it works. What were some interesting things that they did tell you of what they could tell you? Obviously, they couldn't divulge certain things. You know what? It, what they ultimately did was they they told me to pay attention to certain things. To like they they actually give a lot of information out um, within their own list. They say here's some of our reporting channels. Here's they they used to print. Here's our waiting system. Like they used to give a lot of information. So I was mm-hmm. just told to pay attention to what was already public knowledge. Mm-hmm. And so it was for me. It was a combination of paying attention to the the things that they pointed me to that was public knowledge, and then testing real life campaigns against that information to see what what worked and what didn't work. Mm-hmm. And so it was a little bit of of trial and error, and and being willing to to pay attention to the subtle clues. And I, I couldn't even point to one specific subtle clue, but I, I mm-hmm. remember that that uh, the uh, person of the USA Today said, hey, have you ever considered looking on this page on our website or reading this in the newspaper? And I, and I said, no, I hadn't. I went and read it. I'm like, oh, well, that's really interesting. Um, you didn't tell me anything, but you told me a lot by pointing me to that, that page on the website or to that article mm-hmm, in, the, mm-hmm. in, in the paper. Um, so it was just little things like that. It was like public knowledge. Hey, go look at this. Go look at that. You just hey, followed the rabbit hole type of just thing. Follow, just follow the rabbit hole. So pay attention and cont- continue to invest. And the other part of it is I became a resource because all of those people are constantly writing articles. So if Bob Hughes wanted to get a hold of Roy Williams or someone on advertising, well, guess what? I'm going to make that connection. Hmm. If he wanted to get a hold of Marcus Buckingham, I don't know Marcus, but you know what? I'm going to call and find out and figure out how to directly connect the two so that he can interview Marcus for an article. Mm-hmm. So it was it was being open to listening. It was also becoming a resource yeah. to serve the need of the, the people that you're working with. Yeah. Take just taking and taking and taking doesn't serve a relationship like a conversation has to be a, a fair exchange and back and forth. Right. So just keep providing value. And so tell me, the first book that you got to the New York Times bestselling was the Roy Williams book. It was. Uh, it was uh, Secret Formulas of the Wizard of Ads by Roy H. Williams. It was uh, the first book they worked uh, worked on with uh, Ray Bard, um, and uh, it was phenomenal. Um, Roy, as I said, is the fourth largest buyer for radio advertising in North America. Um, he has built some of the biggest brands that that we know, and um, I'll give you an example. In um, diamonds, there are roughly twenty thousand jewelry stores that sell diamonds in North America. Roy has 40, I believe it's 46 clients that sell diamonds that represent almost 39% of all diamonds sold in North America each year. That's crazy. So you don't have that kind of impact unless you know, unless you know what you're doing. Right. Right. Um, so, Roy's brand as created by Ray Bard. Ray Bard came up with the the Wizard of Ads moniker. Mm-hmm. And no, this was before there was a Harry Potter. So it's not there was no playoff Harry Potter at the time. That's kind of coming in after the fact. But whatever, it's fine. The Wizard of Ads is a brand work. Right. Um, and so what we did, because Roy buys so much radio, is we knew that the opportunity was with the sales reps and sales managers at radio stations and with the general managers. Now, yeah. it used to be that Roy would speak at every Radio Bureau State convention. Um, and that all the general managers would see him, and then the general general managers would have their sales reps sign up for his newsletter, which used to be faxed now by e- email called the Monday Morning Memo. Mm-hmm. And so he would. Um, so what we did is we mailed out an advanced copy of the book to the general manager of every radio station in the country, uh, with an offer that said, if you buy twenty copies of this book. Uh, and, uh, between this date and this date at this specific store, we will give you a copy of Roy H. Williams' 12 tape training library. Now, this 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 is this is back in '99, so it's been a few years. Right. Um, this this training is going to train your sales reps how to better sell radio. And the book Secret Formulas of the uh, of the Wizard of Ads advocates that radio is the best form of advertising for a small or medium sized business. Right. And what what um, what we're going to do is we're going to train your sales reps how to better sell radio, we're going to give them a marketing tool written by me, not by them, that argues and advocates that radio is the mm-hmm. best form of advertising. They're going to go out, give the book to potential customers. It's going to convince them to buy radio. Your sales mm-hmm. reps are going to be better trained. They're going to close more They're going to close more uh, sales. So we had, out of 10,000 radio stations in North America, we had almost 1,200 stations that participated in that offer. Wow. We launched the book to number one on the Wall Street Journal, number three on the New York Times bestsellers list, and had... 
uh, we had several hundred thousand radio ads run nationwide for that book. Wow. Right, that that built Roy's platform doing that single promotion. So that yeah. was the, the first book I worked on for Ray Bard. Yeah, yeah, that's phenomenal. Um, so what was the next major milestone, uh, Michael? You know what? I spent the majority of my time after that book um, with Ray Bard for three and a half years, and then he temporarily sold his company, which he bought back to Longstreet Press, where I was the publisher. And then I spent a year at Entrepreneur Press being mm -hmm. the co-publisher with Jerry Counties for their book division. And I spent that time really refining and honing, understanding, publishing, and the machinations of how the bestseller lists work, mm -hmm. right? Because they have... The, the truth is, the, the dirty little secret is that not every book that is sold is reported to the bestsellers list. Not every book that is reported to the bestsellers list is counted. In fact, less than 3% of all say, book sales are reported and counted by the New York Times. Really? Holy list. cow. Yep. Based upon the, the way that the algorithms work. And consider that there are a lot, I mean, there, there, are, there were 1,076,000 books published last year. And there's over estimations in print of 20 to 30 million books in print. So you can have a book that sells 50 copies a year or 100 copies a year or 1,000 copies a year. So on the bottom end of that, you, you don't even want to look at what's selling on a, on a weekly basis, even from, from what's being released from a new standpoint. Mm -hmm. So they, they have their systems to filter it out. Uh, but only 3% of, of all sales that, are, that occur are reported and counted by the bestsellers list. Mm. So... I spent my my five and a half years as a publisher learning publishing, learning how the bestseller list works as a system, right. and then be, being a student of thought leadership platforms, right? And of course, they're changing on an ongoing basis, so you, you're never not a student of that if that's if you work in that industry. But it became a fervent student of understanding what works and what d doesn't. Mm -hmm. And when I was an entrepreneur, it's a great publishing company. We published 35 books that year, none of which I brought in as a publisher from the previous year. And um, they all sold 5,000 copies or more. The problem is that um, none of them, ex only one of the 35 titles, the author had the ability to do a bestseller campaign. So five, selling 5,000 copies on a title is more than most books will sell in their lifetime. So right. we made good money on those books. It was fine. We had a good profitable division, but it wasn't fun or exciting. At that point, I had 18 New York Times bestsellers. I, I was yeah, I was more ingrained in the idea mm -hmm. of putting books on the New York Times bestsellers. You wanted to go list. after the bestseller list. I wanted to go after the bestsellers list, and I wanted to do big, fun, exciting things. Selling 5,000 copies of 30 titles each year was not fun or exciting. Right. I'm, I, again, good business model, just not what I wanted to do. So right. I, I got the entrepreneurial spirit, and I left mm -hmm. and started my own company. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, as it, as with anything, it takes a long time to build it out. It actually, the, the normal cycle is three years, and that's what it took. It took me three years of s scraping by before I made my I made my first two fifty, and then five hundred, and then seven fifty, and then a million or more per year. The, it, it just they're just those system cycles, and truly, it took me three years to get to two fifty. It took me another three years to get a million or more, and that's just that's the normal, from my experience, a normal pattern within growing a business. Was that was that a hard transition from to break out on your own for you? Uh, you know what I I went from a nice cushy salary yeah. to making fifty percent that first year of what I made a, a salary, and then the second year. I made almost as much as I made in salary, and the third year I made three times what I'd made in salary. So right. it, it was hard for the first couple of years, and I had a, a daughter during that that time frame, and so there was there was some, there was some um, pressures. There were some pressures, yeah. but those pressures were good. There's no better reason to 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 work hard than pressures. Yeah. Same reason when I was nine and I wanted clothes, I had the pressure of not want of not wanting to have yucky clothes, wanting to fit in mm -hmm. with kids at school. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Pressure or fear is as valid, a, if not more valid, a, a reason to take an action than 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 pleasure, right? Yeah. And so I had those pressures and and really built and really built it out. Um, yeah. And during that time frame, during those first five years, I became. This is when the internet started exploding and social media really started coming out. And I became a student of the tra the transitioning from brick and mortar platforms for thought leaders to. Um, the virtual platforms that that we now benefit from having the internet and social media and websites and all of those things and really building out those types of businesses. Yeah. 
No. What did, one your, of, what did your business look like when you came out of the gates? And you're like, I'm going to strike out on my own. What did it look like? What were you doing? I went to oh, I was doing anything I could, anything that would bring in money. I was doing PR, which is not my specialty. I was building websites, um, which I wasn't good at the, at the time. Where as I'm great at it now. Um, I was I was doing sales calls for bestseller campaigns. I was mm-hmm. doing anything and everything that I could. Certainly selling the bestseller service. Um, that was the the primary thing that we were doing. But I, I threw in everything I could in the kitchen sink to close sales. Right. And the the first thing that I did is I went back to my past authors from Bard Press, uh, Longstreet Press, and Entrepreneur to see if I could business. And I did whatever I could in that time frame. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I leveraged the relationships that I had built, both in terms of sales, but also um, direct sales, but also in terms of mm-hmm. getting my name and reputation out there to bring in more clients for, right. from a lead flow standpoint. Um, Roy Williams said to me when I, while I was still at Entrepreneur Press, we were at Book Expo that year before I left in New York City. And we, he and I were walking to New York, and he said to me, Michael, the winners and losers in life are determined when the teams are picked. There are two teams that are essential for your success. The first are the team of people who pick you to be on their team, and the second are the people who you pick to be on your team. Hmm. And I've been really fortunate on both of those counts, to have Miriam Bass select me to be on her team, to have um, Ray Bard to select me to be on his team, to have Roy Williams to select me to be on his team, Brian Jeffrey Eisenberg and uh, uh, Marshall Goldsmith and T.R. Becker and on and on and on. I've been yeah. selected by some of the top uh, Peter Yamada, some of the top thought leaders in the world to be on their team. And the other part of that, and what's been hard as you transition as a business owner, is going from a solopreneur to owning a business, right. is making sure that you've got, that you're surrounded by the right team. Yeah. And that team is as essential to your success if you're growing a real business, if you're yeah. moving from being an entrepreneur or a solopreneur to owning a real business, as is the first team. But it, I required having that first team in place in order for me to have the chance to be able to put that second team in place. Yeah, yeah. So, Michael, when you strike out on your own, what is the biggest, what, what starts that big breakthrough? Because you'll do, you know, bring in, you're contacting other authors, you're bringing in whatever business you can. What was that big breakthrough when it was your company? You, you mean uh, when it when it transitioned from the being, bestseller? Yeah, you're like this is what because you knew from early on you wanted to go after that bestseller list, and so what was that first the, well, bestseller? The, yeah, well, the first bestseller that I worked on when I left was John Astroff's book, The Street Guide, The Street Kid's Guide to Having It All. Hmm. Um, uh, but the real breakthrough happened a couple of years. I did a few books, um, two three books a year during those first years. I think I did. Two year, two books the first year, five books the next year. Mm-hmm. But in the third year, I was fortunate to have met Gail Kingsbury, and I was asked to be, to come in and work on a project for T. Harvecker. Mm-hmm. And when I launched that book to number one on the New York Times bestsellers list, and his business um, blew up. Suddenly, then I because I was behind that, and people could see the value. Suddenly, now I had attention, and that's when the business really mm. built up. And it happened the third year. And, and from our experience with our clients, is it takes two or three years of building your business to get to the point where something you're is going to happen. For that, that yeah. where you're ready for that. We have a, a friend of ours who took photos of us here in Calgary. She's been a photographer for three years, and th- this year she had a photo of a. Of a wedding, of a of a, a husband and wife, a bride and groom, um, on a hill, um, overlooking with Calgary in the background, with this big giant storm coming in that mm. went viral all over the internet. Mm. Could we have predicted that? No. But what I what I know as a matter yeah. of fact is, if you've got a good model, every single time in year year three, you've built up enough mm. to where where you're big enough where people are now taking you serious, mm. Mm. and you're now in position for that to happen. Yeah. And in truth, it, my my experience is. It is in three-year increments where you see that iterative growth. You have three years where you're at, and then mm-hmm. and at the third year, you're ready for the next level. And, and mm-hmm. when you're at that next level, it's going to take you another three years before you're ready to move to the next level. Mm-hmm. And it kind of goes into what I want to ask about your book, Pendulum, because it's the same type of Cyclical. cycle that you study. Yeah. Um, but back to the TR Becker for a second, that book was everywhere. I remember that when that came out. It was absolutely everywhere. It was. That's good. That's good marketing. Yeah. So the three percent counted. What what can you tell the audience? Well, here, about here's that? the thing. 
So three yeah. percent of the total volumes of books sold each week. Yeah. Now most books that are on the list have forty to sixty percent of their actual sales being reported and counted. If you're at that level, you, you're high enough in terms of volume that you're mm -hmm. getting a higher percentage than three percent. Uh, my clients get between 80 to 90 percent of our sales being reported and counted because we know what all of the rules are. So mm -hmm. all of our marketing efforts are aimed at meeting the rules within the system. Mm -hmm. right? That's mm -hmm. just smart. Mark if we're going to mar be marketing anyway, let's be intentional about it and make sure that we're sending enough sales through Barnes and Noble and Books really? Million and out, right. We just we just meet the rules. Yeah. And so it requires having that platform. If someone came to me and they're working a nine to five job, making seventy five thousand dollars a year, I can't make them the bestseller. They don't have the audience or the platform in place to do that. But mm -hmm. if you, but if you have a platform, a thought leadership platform of any kind, uh, personal development, spiritual, self help, diet and health, any of those areas, if you've got a big enough audience, yeah. meaning that you've got a real business around it, I can assist in leveraging your existing platform in meeting all of the rules of the criteria uh, mm -hmm. to make the list. And that, interestingly enough, um, I've had a lot of questions in the last week because of Ted Cruz. I don't know if you saw the Ted mm -hmm. Cruz controversy, but the New York Times didn't let him on the list. Mm. He sold oh, 11,800 sales or something. And the New York Times said, nope, you, didn't, you, you bought your way onto the list. Mm. And I have a competitor who um, has been eviscerated in the media because what – they do and what what other non-ethical marketers do is they say well just buy the books we'll tell you where to buy the books right. in bulk and then you'll make the list but what i know to be true because what we really do is build thought leadership platforms is that it's not about the best seller the best seller is a reflection of what is necessary to grow the business if it were a cake the best being a bestseller isn't the cake. It's not even the icing on the cake. It's the cherry on the top of the cake. And the benefit of being a bestseller isn't on being the bestseller. It's in the activity of figuring out how to sell the books, right. genuinely market and sell the books, yeah. in order to get that cherry. Yeah. It's how, it's what are the ingredients to build the cake? What are mm. the ingredients to make the icing? How long do we need to cook that cake for? Yeah. Um, how do we spread the icing properly? And then you get the benefit of the cherry at the end of yeah. the process. Yeah. It's almost like the byproduct because when I was reading the case study of Ivan Meisner that you have, it's like they, I think, increased their membership by, to like 75,000 members. So it wasn't even necessarily the bestseller, but what the bestseller did is what you're saying. That's right. It, 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 the bestseller is a fine outcome. It's, it is an objective that we want to accomplish. Yeah. But it's not about being a bestseller. It's yeah. about you, the people who hire us think, I have this business objective, and if only I were a bestseller, it would yeah. help me accomplish that objective. And the truth is, unless you tie the two directly together, yeah. it probably won't impact the business objective. Yeah. yeah. Right. I, uh, it's funny lot. you say that because that's why people call you. They call you because they want to be a bestseller. And I remember listening to your seven myths, and one of them is not everyone should be a bestseller, right? No. So what? in which cases someone should know – what their goals are like when when does someone come to you and you go no you you do not want to be a bestseller this is all, what the, you're all the time most of the people that approach us yeah. they they want to accomplish some other business objective they want to yeah. increase lead flow they want it they want to um they, they want to excite their audience they want to do something else mm -hmm. and they think their belief is that the book and being a bestseller will do that now a book can do that but oftentimes there are better ways to do that. And the truth is, if you want to play the bestseller game, your marketing budget for your company needs to be between three to five hundred thousand hmm. dollars. Right? If you can't that's not to say that we'll spend that, but mm -hmm. if you don't have that as a marketing budget, your platform isn't big enough to support being a bestseller. Period. Mm -hmm. You need to That's, obviously double or triple that to pay for the the marketing spend is what you're saying. Right. So but if yeah. you but if you can't spend it then, you're, then it's an illustration that your business isn't ready for being a bestseller mm -hmm. and your platform, your audience size isn't big enough yeah. to be able to support being a bestseller. And that's, that's what I'm looking for. If you've got three to $500,000 in your marketing budget for a year that you're willing to invest in a book, mm -hmm. then you can have the conversation about being a bestseller. And if the mm -hmm. answer is no, anything less than 300000 needs to go into building your infrastructure, your conversion systems, the products and services that you're offering, and yeah. the, the system to build your audiences. Yeah. Right? Uh, get, doing a, a bestseller is when you hit that proverbial glass ceiling and you need to break through. Right. And when you're at that point, three or five hundred thousand or more, great. We'll use the book as the 
as the excuse to create a bigger conversation, mm-hmm. right? And a bestseller is a bestseller is based upon your existing audience. It's not based upon anyone else who doesn't know you buying your book. No, the bestseller is a hundred percent based upon your ability to market the book to people who already know and love you, mm-hmm. right? Once you're a bestseller, then you move into what we call audience engagement, and audience engagement will leverage your bestseller success to take your message to a wider audience and build your audience. But if you can't, if your audience isn't big enough in the first place to support a bestseller, then b- before you look at the book as a tool to build your audience here at audience engagement, no, you've got to build your audience over here so that you can support the bestseller, so that you can then get to audience engagement. If that makes, if that makes sense. Yes. You know, what I thought was interesting, reading through the Ivan Meisner where they, you know, doubled in size to more than 75,000, they sold more than 15,000 books on Master's Day. There was, you won an award, the Benjamin Franklin Award for Innovation. And what I thought was interesting- It's now, by the way, it's now called the Miriam Bass. Oh, really? Miriam Bass uh, uh, Award for Innovation and Excellence in Marketing. When she died, like like I said, she's that big of a legend Mm. that when she died, they renamed the award in her honor. Wow. What I thought was interesting about that in the case studies, it said four campaigns that cost under ten thousand dollars. Right. So in that case, what? How did that work? Because well, no, Ivan Meisner owns BNI, Business Network International. It's right. the world's largest business referral organization, and it's a franchise organization. Um, and so the the franchise owners in an area make money from people who sign up for membership, and then they pay their franchise fee back to BNI. Mm-hmm. And so membership drives are really important to BNI as an organization. So what you have is a is an or, and, and in fact within BNI, uh, if you're in a chapter, you want more members in your chapter because it means when it's your turn turn to get uh, referrals, you'll get more referrals, which increases your revenue. Mm-hmm. And so there's an incentive for everyone to, to continually put more members, get more members into BNI chapters. And so what we said is how do we leverage the members' excitement to get behind the book and the franchise owner's excitement? So what we did is we set up, um, the first time we did this, 56 book signings on the same day at the same time um, for a book titled Masters of Networking. And we had the franchise owners from BNI contribute a chapter to the book, and then they went to their book signing, had all of their members bring potential members to the book signing, Mm -hmm. and so... They couldn't sell BNI at the book signings, but they're selling BNI anyway because the members are bringing them in anyway. And that's how we doubled the size of the organization because we use the book as the excuse to be able to spread that message. Mm-hmm. And what is the cost to Ivan as the primary author to do that? Nothing. Yeah, he I mean, owns there, the, he owns it. Yeah. There, there's so the cost is is my time or the time of his assistant getting information and coordinating all of these things. Right. So is there a cost? Yes. But it's we don't have to we don't have to do radio. We don't yeah, have to, you don't have to pay yeah. all these radio stations because there's a, this inherent kind of system no, or audience set up. Yeah, there's no PR firm to hire. There's no there's nothing. There's literally nothing for us to to go and do. It's just it's just coordinating all of these and the bookstores love it because we're driving massive traffic into their stores. Mm-hmm. So this goes back to what I was saying about platform. It's understanding. What is the platform and how do we leverage that mm-hmm. in the gener- generation of the sale? Now, Ivan still needed to have a budget potential of three to 500000 We didn't have to spend any of it because his platform he was He must have so liked big. you. Yeah. He did. <laughs> that's, what, that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. that, that's what I'm saying. It, the, 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 the amount is necessary to indicate mm-hmm. that you've got a big enough platform. If he mm-hmm. spent, could he spend on marketing up to $500,000? And the answer was yes. Yeah. Would he be willing to do it to make it a bestseller? If necessary, mm-hmm. the answer was yes. I didn't need him to, but mm-hmm. I needed him to commit to being able to spend that if necessary. Right, right, right. And so that's that's what you're that's what you're that's what we're looking at is do you have a big enough audience for B and I? Absolutely, it was a big enough audience. Mm-hmm. It goes back to what you were saying about Ray Bard, the real platform. So for each individual person, you have to really dig into what's their real platform and design a, a specific campaign for that author and for that that's business. Right. That's right. Yeah. So what's been the biggest outlier, Michael, that you would say? Outlier, I mean that people from the outside would think, how did this person, maybe they they weren't well-known. Because one of your myths is you have to be famous, right? Um, they're not well-known. They didn't have a huge platform. Maybe they didn't have a huge budget. What's been the biggest outlier that you've seen uh, make it to the bestseller or sell tons of books? Here's the thing. My experience is if you are willing to say, you know what, 
I, I, I shouldn't do this, but I'm going to commit three to five hundred thousand dollars if mm-hmm. I have to. It represents forty percent of our net revenue last year, or eighty percent, or whatever. If you're willing to commit to doing it, mm-hmm. not once. There's there's a reason I'm eighty four for eighty four. Not once have I ever had a client not be able to do it. Mm-hmm. The, the reality is, if you're willing to commit to the numbers, you'll do it. Period. Mm-hmm. Because you don't want to spend the three hundred five, three to five hundred thousand dollars. So you're going to call in every favor that you you can. You're going to use your intellectual capital, your relationship capital, and financial capital to fi- to work with me to figure that out. The number one thing that I find for people who are bestsellers versus not is that they do it. In fact, Hemingway said um, that the difference between a non-writer and a writer is that the writer writes. The difference between someone who's a bestseller and someone who's not is that the person who becomes a bestseller has done what's necessary to become a bestseller. Mm-hmm. And if you're if you don't have the budget today to be able to commit the three hundred five hundred thousand dollars, that's fine. Mm-hmm. Then you have to commit to the step before, which is building the platform. And depending on where you where you're at, you're going to trade time, money, or quality. But if you're willing to put put in the the time, money, or, or quality to make it happen, at some point you're going to be in a position to do it. Right. The the myth that we have in the the U.S. is it's the get rich quick uh, myth. We cannot we're going to write a good book and the 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 heavens are going to open and the angels are going to shine down on us and the book's going to become a huge success. And that's a massive massive myth that just doesn't right. happen. Maybe right. one book a year. And for me, hope is not a strategy. It's just not. Um, so if you're willing to do the work to go out and uh, this is not this is my message for me because this has been my life. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. I'm not the most brilliant man on the planet. I'm just willing to go out and do the hard work and to look at look at how how uh, things work and go out and work harder than everybody else. Mm-hmm. I'm willing to go and ask the questions that no one else is willing to ask. I'm willing to go out and do the hard work that nobody else is willing to do, and that has led me to where I am. So it's the same thing here. If are you willing to commit to being a bestseller, whatever that means? Are you willing to commit three to five hundred thousand if necessary or, or marketing? If not, are you willing to commit to building the platform to be able to have an audience big enough where you are willing to commit that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Michael, I can go. On. I can go for the next uh, probably rest of the day with questions. Um, I reached out to some entrepreneurs who are going to release a book or planning in the future, and I said, "What questions do you have? We have one of the, you know, one of the best in the business in the world. What questions do you have?" And so here's a couple questions, and you could just answer one or two, whatever you think would be best. Uh, some of them you covered a little bit, but the questions that came back were the best methods, and I'll send them this interview, obviously, but the best methods of authors building a list ahead of time. Um, what did the promotion look like to get on the New York Times bestseller? What does engagement look like after book launch? What's the what's important to include on the book website? Like, do you recommend a whole separate site or a current page on the site? And then people ask about media coverage secrets. Um, which one do you think would be the best to to answer? It's all hard. Most of the answers actually go back to a philosophy that we have called the 12 steps of intimacy. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, a product or service sale is when your goals and values meet the goals and values of your customer. If you're here and they're here, it doesn't, it doesn't really mm-hmm. matter. And this is part of the, this, uh, this one of the services that we offer called audience engagement. Mm-hmm. Um, it, 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 the 12 Steps of Intimacy was developed by, by a clinical researcher and psychologist Desmond Morris in the 1960s. And uh, what he was doing was he was looking to define whether homo sapien primates are pair bonded or promiscuous in nature. This and, is the last answer I thought you were going to give. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it, I, it, I, it's fine. It it's, it I, I love that you give a, an answer that I'm not expecting at all, but go, go ahead. Sorry about that. Um, we talked about before this call that I, I, uh, one of the things that I do is I see different right, dis- connections things and, and, yeah. and make connections. So, no, I love it. Go on, Michael. Yeah. Marketing, marketing is about the transference of confidence from one person to another. Right. What this requires is an understanding of psychology. What right. I've become a, an avid student of is psychology. But we have to also understand human nature in that context. So yeah. if we go back, we look at the work of Desmond Morris and his 12 Steps of Intimacy, and he was defining, are homo sapiens pair bonded or promiscuous? And what he found is that, that homo sapiens... Uh, as a whole, prefer to have pair bonded relationships, even if we desire promiscuity, hmm. th- that we want the security of pair bonded relationships. So then what he looked at was w- what is necessary in order to perpetuate a long term pair bonded relationship for homo sapiens. Hmm. And what he found is that at the foundational level of relationship, 
um, there are 12 steps that must be followed. And that if you skip more than any one of those 12 steps, so any two steps, step three and four, four, five, three and eight, 10 and 11, that the psychological damage to both parties would be the same as having a one night stand. Hmm. And that the probability of that being a long term relationship was less than 5%. Yeah. Right. So the question that I would ask to you is, yeah. what is the psychological, not physical difference, but the psychological difference between building a pair bonded relationship with someone else yeah. versus building a relationship with your customer as a thought leader? What's yeah. the psychological difference? If you, you know, promiscuity versus the pair bonded, you mean? Well, the uh, homo sapiens prefer yeah. pair, having a pair bonded relationship. Right. Right. And that's built through the development of intimacy, the 12 steps of intimacy mm -hmm, that have mm -hmm. to be developed between the two parties. Yeah. So what's the difference psychologically between building a relationship with someone in business and yeah. building a relationship with nothing, someone? Yeah. Nothing. It, it, yeah. It's the same. So what, what we look at is when you're building a thought leadership business, what are the 12 steps of intimacy that you're building with your customers so that you're not treating, the, so you're not acting like a pickup artist trying to get the customer into mm. be, into the customer's pants, yeah. right? Uh, a woman knows when a man <laughs> that's wants to get into the That's a good way pants, of putting it, yeah. And the consumer knows when we want to get into their pants to grab their wallet and take their money. It's right. this, it, we, we feel it, we know right, it. Right, right, right. And so what, what we look at is that in terms of those 12 steps, step one mm. is eye, eye to body. I see a beautiful woman across the room. Step 12 is, is having intercourse or having sex, yeah. having that intimate action. Step eight is kissing. What we forget, again, taking intimate, what we do in an intimate environment into mm -hmm. a non-intimate environment, mm -hmm. we forget what we do in selling and in, in interpersonal communication is this back and forth um, engagement and sharing of intimacy until one or both parties are comfortable enough to move forward. Yeah. Right? That's what we do. When we translate that over to marketing and non-intimate environments, because we do um, – in, in an intimate environment, so unconsciously, we forget that it applies over in marketing. And in fact, it's even more important that we're sensitive in advertising and marketing um, to those little nuanced details. And so what happens is most authors, most thought leaders, most most business owners end mm. up acting like pickup artists. They apply a Dan mm. Kennedy style of direct marketing approach with the intention of getting the customer getting into the customer's uh, pants. And they do it successfully to get revenue, but they end up on the hamster wheel of burning and churning and burning and churning and burning and churning and bur burning and, and churning, right? And it's just it's just like a pickup artist. I'm just getting the I'm just getting the person's pants. I'm just getting the person's pants. I'm just getting the person's pants. That's it. There is no longevity. There is no long term relationship. Mm -hmm. And I would submit to you that violates the entire concept of being a thought leader because at some level, most thought leaders act at, act in an intimate. Um, capacity with their audience, with their right. customers, with their clients. And so when you look at those 12 steps, step eight is kissing. Well, we would put a book at step eight or step nine. And the reason for this is you have to look at the currencies that are being exchanged. Um, money is not the primary currency that we exchange in this world. It, it's only one of four currencies. So mm -hmm. the currencies that we look at are time, energy, information, and money. And money mm -hmm. is usually the last currency that we have the right to ask for. So if I, as a consumer, am considering buying your book, what is the currency that I'm most concerned about spending? Yeah. I mean, oh, um, I mean, it's a book's not that expensive. So, you know, it's probably time and energy, I would assume. It's, it's probably primarily time. Yeah. It, it, we all have shelf help on our shelves, books that we bought that we haven't read. Our consideration is... Am I going to spend the four, six, or eight hours to read the right. book? It's a big commitment. And that's the commitment. That, yeah. I, that so, so if I've never heard of you before and you say, buy my book, you're going from 10 minutes of time on a radio show to eight hours of time reading my book. I'm sorry. Is there not a disconnect between the right, two? Right, right, right. Right. So what we do when we look at, at promoting a book is the very front end of that is what is the audience engagement sequence? How are we taking – where are we meeting the customer right. with media or online, um, advertising or PR or whatever? Um, wh where are the audience coming from? What are their felt needs? Mm -hmm, what are their mm -hmm. stated felt needs and yeah. their unstated felt needs? And what is the first engagement that we want them to have? How do we have them feel seen by us? Right. 
right? We want them to, we want to create, we want to emulate what happens in the real world in terms of building that relationship. Yeah. So how do we help, help them feel seen by us? And how do we ask for small amounts of currency until we've, until we've earned the right to yeah. ask for more currency and then more currency and more currency. And yeah. the very first currency that we have to earn is time. Yeah. Right, that's yeah. the very first currency that we have to, to win. Roy Williams would say, to win a customer's money, you must first win their time. And I would add, in addition to that, their energy and uh, their information is yeah. necessary in order to get to the right to ask for the book. So what, what we do in book promotion, if it's just book promotion for the bestseller, is to build out from, from the book backwards what that sequence is yeah. at each of those eight levels. Yeah. Right? And And – Usually we'll tie the book into whatever that step nine is of the 12 steps so that yeah. they get the business – so it meets the business objective because the book is just that precipitatory event that leads into that ninth step. Yeah. Right? Michael, thank you for answering that like that. Completely unexpected and I'm actually mad that no one's told me about this book before. I've uh, never – no one's ever mentioned this before. And it's, it seems like a perfect business and personal book that everyone should read. It's not a business Actually. book. It, it, it's it's right. just – Desmond Morris's work was just in psychology. Yeah. And so unless you're a student of psychology and uh, human evolution, you're probably not going to know about hmm. it. I was actually just on a, a call with Tucker Max the other day. Mm. And yeah. he knew – he the pickup artist, right? He knew of the work of Desmond Morris because it plays directly into uh, – he's no longer a pickup artist, but the things that he used to do as a pickup artist. Because you, if you understand the, the mm -hmm. psychology mm -hmm. and human evolution, right. as a pickup artist, you can play into that. So mm – -hmm. um, Anyway, same. You you have to be you have to think like that. And as a marketer, my objective is, and this also goes back to pendulum. When you move right. from which we don't have time to go into today, when you move from a me cycle to a we cycle, you have to go from direct marketing right. to relationship based marketing. Right. And to understand relationship marketing requires understanding relationships and psychology. Right. So. Right. Michael, so many questions. Um, you know, we're five minutes past the hour, so I appreciate your time. So I'm gonna I'm gonna keep it to one last question. Even sure. though I didn't get my, my pendulum questions in, which is a long discussion, uh, big challenges question, your proudest moment question, um, big advice, your rituals question. Um, so before I ask the last question, just tell people where they can go to find out more. What are you working on lately? Uh, so the um, they go to promote – if they want to know more about our bestseller services, they can go to promotebook.com, P-R-O-M-O-T-E-A-B-O-O-K.C-L-M. If they want free information and free advice on publishing, we've got some great white papers uh, over at beneaththecover.com, B-E-N-E-A-T-H-T-H-E-C-O-V-E-R.com. Mm -hmm. In fact, on the website, we have a white paper on how to publish a best-selling book, which really goes into great detail about how publishing works, a lot of the things that I've learned over the years, mm -hmm. and what systems you, you need to have in place to have a successful publishing campaign, whether you do a bestseller or not. Mm -hmm. You should read the white paper so you understand how the retailers work and how the publishers work and, and your engagement within that so that you can properly have success or so that you can have the proper expectation of what is going to happen with your campaign because that's yeah. one of the, the other big issues that we have are authors that come in with one expectation and the reality doesn't match that. Yeah. So many questions, so little time. You know, I want to mention people should check out Pendulum too. It talks really cool. It's about you know cycles and and predicting the future essentially with these cycles in we versus me. So I just want to mention that because I had a couple bunch of questions on that, which um, I'm going to hold off so you can get your next uh, thing that you have to do. But last question, Michael, and thank you is so what authors are on your list that you want to work with? I'm Sure. Um, Dan Pink would be one. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'd love to work with Marcus Buckingham. I'd mm -hmm. love to work with um, oh um, Malcolm Gladwell. Um, yeah, I'm just I was just you know curious about that. And uh, any last parting words that uh, we want to impart? You know, I would say. One, know what your outcome or objective is. Like, if you do, the, the saying a ship with no rudder will end up exactly where it's meant to go will apply mm -hmm. if you don't know what your objective is. Right. So, define, know how you define success and then know how you can measure it because having an objective that isn't measurable will never be accomplishable. So, define success, be able to measure it, and then go put the people around you that are necessary to help you accomplish it because at the end of the day, 
you are the CEO of your life, the CEO of your company, and the CEO of your book. Nobody cares more about what you're doing than you. However, you also don't care about marketing and PR and editing and all of the other things that are necessary for your success. So a good leader set, uh, sets the vision um, and holds the intention and makes sure that they're surrounded by the right team. Right. So as Roy said, go make sure that you are surrounded by the right team of people that buy into your vision that will help you accomplish your objective. Don't try to do it all yourself. Yeah, yeah. Michael, it's been an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, it's my pleasure, Jeremy. Thanks so much. Thanks. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. 